Our four o'clock informational meeting. We're at Carnegie Town Hall. I appreciate those of you who are here with us and those of you who are watching on CityLink and on SiouxFalls.org. It's good to have all of you here with us. Council's all here this week, too. That's good. We'll uh, have some reports on things we were doing last week as we move through. We begin with staff report. Lori Hogstead, City Clerk. All right. Hello, Council Chair Erpenbach and fellow Council members. First of all, I just wanted to remind uh, the council as well as the citizens that we will have a Charter Revision Commission working session this Thursday at 3.30, and that will be held in the multi-purpose room. Um, and what we are going to do with this particular meeting, it will not be videotaped, but it will be uh, tape recorded, and then we are going to produce a set of what we're going to call notes and place those notes on SIRE so that if you're not able to attend, um, you will be able to take a look at those notes and see what was uh, discussed. Um, the items that will be covered will be the first three sections of the city charter, and that would include powers of the city, um, city council, and mayor. So sections one, two, and three. Um, sections four, five, and six will be discussed on November 8th, again at a working session, and then the last three sections, or I guess their articles, will be covered on January 10th. So just an update on that. And construction, as you notice, our north entrance is closed off. They are working on the concrete. Jack hammered it all out on Friday and, and possibly some of it over the weekend. That will take about another week to complete. It looks like they're putting the forms up now, so hopefully we'll be pouring soon. Um, as far as the rest of the building, the roofing is complete except for a punch list. Um, and that looks really nice. If you look, stand back from the building a little ways and take a look and they've painted up on the top on the decorative trim along the building and it, it really makes it stand out. It's, it really looks nice. Um, the tuck pointing is also completed. They're just going to be working on a punch list for that as well. And uh, boy, what a difference that made in the building as well. And then painting, they're painting the windows outside and we hear all this little scratching throughout the day outside. <laughs> and it's uh, the individuals out painting. In fact, I think there's a gentleman out there today. And then they are also cleaning the storm windows and just cleaning the windows right now, the way that they look, they just look fantastic. You can actually see out the windows really well. And so that will probably be about the end of October be before that's completed. And just anyone that may not be here at this point and is going to be attending our meeting tonight, that they will need to enter through the west door. And then uh, there's supposed to be a sign put up. I looked about three. Is, I'm not sure. There is. Okay, good. Um, just to direct people to our west door, since our uh, front door that people normally come in will be blocked. So soon we're coming to an end with that. You keep saying that, Lori. I know it. I, I keep hoping it's almost done. But For those of us who are directionally challenged, the west entrance is the Argus Leader side yes, of the that's building. That's a great way to say it. Dakota Avenue, um, if you come on Dakota, uh, or the Argus Leader side, that would be the entrance to come in. That's great. correct. Good. Any that's questions for Lori? Report. Thank you, Lori. All right, thanks. General contractor and all of this. Yeah, Thank you so all that much. good stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, appreciate your work. Audit committee report from Thursday, October 4th. Councillor Jamison. Thank you. <clears throat> we did have a meeting last Thursday. Uh, we had a few items to cover. First and foremost, we introduced a new audit committee member, Kim Schroeder. She is uh, replacing uh, uh, one of the staff members that left. So we have full audit committee staff, uh, at least with Rich Oaksel and his internal audit team. We have a full staff now. We had a couple items uh, that we report, reviewed the audit reports on the light and power and purchasing and procurement. Uh, one of the items is uh, still in committee. We haven't accepted a final report. We'll be doing that uh, <clears throat> next meeting, I, I assume. The other is uh, thing we covered was changes to the internal audit charter. And they're kind of minor, but the committee is still reviewing those and look for next year probably a recommended, some recommended changes to the charter that the full council will have a chance to weigh in on and vote. Um, pretty minor changes to that as well. One of the big things I suppose, if anything, is uh, Rich Oaksel is referred to as the internal auditor, lead internal auditor, and we might change his name or title, not his name, 
I think he likes his name. Uh, but it would be to uh, probably uh, um, internal audit manager. But HR is aware of that. They're going to look at it. Uh, but just some things and changes coming up for the audit committee. Any questions? Good. Questions for Councilor Jamison. Good. Thank you. Thanks for your work. Fiscal committee report from Tuesday, October 2nd. Councilor Karski. Yes, we met last Tuesday and we had a very spirited and lively meeting. It started out basically goes back, our process goes back to April or May of this year when Councilor Jamison and I were kind of given the task of reviewing a CIP committee and to see if that is a feasible thing for us to bring back. And we discovered that it is a cumbersome process to have a committee such as that. And quite frankly, that is the role of the city council. So we decided we'd try a new approach and through several meetings with our staff and um, Director Turback and others from the administration, we um, figured out maybe a different process to go, basically a communication and vision process for the long term, seeking input from the administration, from the public, open houses and this type of thing. And this is what Councillor Jamison and I brought to the um, fiscal committee last week. Um, we had some lively discussion on it. Uh, it was mostly positive with a lot of concern about the timeline on getting this type of a thing done. Um, Director Cooper gave us some comments and we decided we're going to follow the, that route at this point and we'd like to bring before the entire council um, Director Cooper and, Cooper, and I think that's at a November 20th meeting is when we'll be doing this. Uh, basically what he's going to be presenting is anticipated public and private de development around town. Um, kind of a briefing to the entire council, something that they do to service groups and this type of thing throughout the year. And then to, for us to decide if this is something that through the fiscal committee we want to enable that to be brought into all the districts throughout the community for councilors to be present at different times so they can help their constituents, the people in their neighborhoods be aware of the process, what goes on, and be available for input into the CIP budget process. Um, so November 20th, with the council's permission, that's what we would be looking at doing. Uh, by charter, our, our, the development of the budget is the responsibility of the mayor, but we are charged with passing and improving the budget. And to that end, we're just trying to figure out a way to make it a process that lasts throughout more throughout the entire year and not a book that comes to us in June for discussion at that point. So that's where we finished on. There's other input or anything that I missed from any of the fiscal committee members. I'd appreciate it. Councilor Jamison. I'll add a comment if I could. <clears throat> the uh, discussion at the fiscal committee was spirited and I suppose uh, well-founded. It's probably a very good example of a couple of councilors coming to the table thinking we had it all figured out and we learned that there's more and uh, more that could be done and could be done better probably. Uh, Councilor Aguilar added a lot of good things that I probably wasn't ready to receive at that moment. But stepping back, she does add some very good ideas and I think the, the biggest thing is to uh, expound on the fact that some of us were at a different pace, probably wanted some results a little faster than was probably correct. Um, I think Councilor Aguilar added I've got a list here of details that she added, and they're all very good. And it's all about having a better plan and more details. Um, so very much uh, a good example of more heads coming together and making a better plan uh, for the long term. You know, Councilor Karski and I have spent an enormous amount of time trying to get it done. And we probably just really didn't do it in a pace and or with proper details that I think we have now. And I had stated that perhaps I should pass the ball to somebody else and let them carry it, but, but I'd still be willing to carry it, I guess, the rest of the way if we need to. But I think uh, we learned a lot from that fiscal committee, and I think uh, we'll, you know, the next meeting, I think we'll probably be able to lay out the plan better. That helps. Other comments regarding the meeting? Councillor Staggers. Yes, I, I think one of the concerns that some council members have is that, 
you know, when it comes to CIP, you know, we, we really see it uh, just for a few weeks and then we vote on it. We don't really have any input at all in it. Is there going to be any uh, uh, possibility that in the future we can maybe try to have the city council more involved from the very beginning? Because those uh, uh, departments or individuals that you know, put the uh, CIP together right at the beginning, I mean, they're most likely going to get their there's past, what they want, and the longer you are going down the line here, the, the less uh, opportunity you have getting something in the CIP. Councilor Karski, response? Yeah, if I, I can address that, Councilor Staggers, and that's, that is the ultimate goal, for us to have a, a mm -hmm. process that doesn't begin in June and end in September, but maybe something that has our involvement and our fingers in it to some extent so that we, um, when we approve it, it, it is truly something that we mm -hmm. want and not just presented to us for a very short period of time, but also the, the entire um, openness and um, inv community involvement just so that we can be out there with our people, so we can be out listening and um, sharing what's going on. Other comments? Councilor Staggers, go ahead. Yeah, I, I guess. Uh is that going to be something within the next year that's probably going to happen, or what do you think? I guess that'll be up to the um, fiscal committee to bring it to the entire council, because we're working on the process right now. Uh -huh. I mean, we don't have a process, and that's what we're working on, is the process. And we don't know what that process is going to be yet, whether it'll be done through a resolution, and if, is it going to be a one-year thing, or is it something that's going to be ongoing for, the, mm -hmm. for future councils? Thank you. Mm -hmm. A couple of observations. As you know, I was at a distance from this particular meeting and I heard about it almost immediately from where I was. And a couple of observations. I think Councilor Jameson is right. He's, he has relearned how well this group can work together. I mean, we are all eight very different people, but we do work pretty well together if we allow each other to listen to each other, if we allow each other to participate. And the other thing that I would suggest and remind, and I've been kind of a nag about is that we all need to be attending all the committee meetings as much as possible and be okay with giving your input you know even if you're not on the committee maybe you need to stand up and testify to that committee you know let's all be part of that process I think that's part of how this council works best is when we listen to each other and we all participate together any other comments on this particular item fiscal committee Anything else? We'll wait to see how this comes out then as we move forward. Appreciate your work, Councilor Karski. So we are okay then for the November 20th informational meeting? Yeah, it's been set as far as I know. I set the meeting while I was in pier. As, uh, yeah, it's taken care of. Thank so, you. Yep, you bet. City Council open discussion. Councilor Anderson. Oh. <clears throat> Over the weekend, I got a few uh, phone calls talking about our project trim. Uh, which was something that was brought to the council last week. Uh, over the weekend, some of our citizens along Marion Road, uh, right in the middle of the construction project, uh, found out that their area had been surveyed, and they had all gotten letters saying that they now need to cut their trees. Unfortunately, the letter didn't state what trees, uh, you know, exactly what needs to be trimmed. It just gives a height. Um, you know, since this council has been uh, sworn in and our mayor, we have been really pushing for customer service. Um, I feel this is bad customer service. When we do the uh, work at that scope and we're out there removing trees, uh, that should have been the best time to cut and trim trees out there. These citizens have endured uh, all summer, the construction, the dirt, and everything out there. And I feel that this letter now is sort of a little slap in the face to them for everything they've waited for all summer. And I hope that we will take a look at a uh, hard look at that uh, program and uh, maybe make some changes. What do you propose, Councilor Anderson? Well, I think that there's already been discussion on, in that, uh, you know, in that form. Uh, one of, with one of our citizens and the Parks Department. I think maybe it's time either uh, public services or land use uh, takes that up and takes a look at it. It's the feeling of the council. Council Jamison. 
I think I saw an email as well of somebody who was, who was uh, not informed of the details. Uh, I didn't have a chance to follow up with Parks or the Forestry Division. It may have been an oversight on their communication, but yeah, let's work through that, figure that out. The, uh, just something that popped in my head when you were talking about Marion Road being rebuilt was, I don't know how the council might feel, but what if during a major road reconstruction where they come in and, and I don't even know all the details of Marion Road, but if, if they're repairing the road or redoing the road from curb to curb, maybe just as part of that cycle, they go in and they trim the, those trees at that time ahead of the construction because surely they need to get in there with their equipment and not damage their equipment by a, a tree that's too low. But maybe that's a way to kind of help everybody out through a construction cycle, but just a thought that came into my head. Councillor Aguilar. As someone who has had that letter uh, a few years ago, it isn't, you are not told in the letter which of your trees. It's just they do give you just that height that they have to be at, and then, you know, you hope that you've chosen uh, the proper trees to trim. I, I too, would like to have further discussion on this issue and would like um, the forestry department to come in and maybe we need to tweak the process. Okay, Councilor Karski, comment? And I, I know it's not just along Marion Road, it was because I have a staff person that works way out west of there that got the same letter and they were wondering what tree they needed to trim up also and of course I didn't know. You didn't run out there and check for them? Not yet. I'm disappointed in you as a counselor and as a boss, for heaven's sake. <laughs> it's a Counsel neighbor too, so I should, yes. <laughs> counselor Anderson, a comment. Well, I guess just to continue, last year it was 46th Street, I believe, uh, was under construction. Councilman Jamison and I both got uh, calls on that one where uh, the project manager, the construction team that was out there actually were... Uh, Rip, not ripping trees out, but they were grinding the base of trees, basically essentially killing the trees, mm -hmm. and then telling the property owners it was their responsibility to finish removing them. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, Councilman Jamison, for joining in with me on that one to get that resolved. Uh, but I, I just see this as a growing problem as we do this construction in, in neighborhoods and everything with once again, we encourage our citizens to plant trees, but take absolutely no responsibility for those trees. And then when we go in and do the construction, uh, you know, the, we're, we're tearing these trees out and doing things that are negatively impacting our citizens. And I, I'm glad that we are gonna take a look at this. Good, thank you, Councilor Anderson. Councilor Rolfing. Well, um, thank you. Um, first, I was wondering why Councilor Karski didn't go out and do the trimming Could himself. Could have trimmed it himself, couldn't yeah, he? Yeah. What kind I of mean, public services? Boss this? like that, yeah. Um, but uh, otherwise, um, I, I guess I have not seen the letter, and I would like to see the letter, but I, uh, the only trees that, uh, that, that could possibly be in the way would be the ones in the park, wouldn't they, or the ones overhanging the tree, over, overhanging the street. Yes. So I, I, I can't imagine it could be too hard to figure out which trees they're talking about. Well. But... Anyway, Many of us I would on be, the council have received the letter, including our clerk. She will email it to you. Okay, so that, that would be fine. I'm not done yet, though, if I could. Go ahead. Yep. Um, so that we don't spend a lot of time just addressing this. Uh, I would be happy as chairman of the land use to take this on and, and get that uh, taken care of if that's what you would desire. But I wonder if that's I, what we need to do at this point, if we need to bring it to that much of an attention. I'm going to hear from Councilor okay. Aguilar and then I'll comment. Um, just Aguilar. going back to what uh, Councilor Wolfman was saying, I believe it's not just over the street. It's over the sidewalks, too. Yeah. And if you have trees on a corner that are obstructing traffic view, those also come into play. Okay, I can see that. Okay. Any other comments? Then as chair, I'm going to ask Councilor Anderson, I believe this one feels more like it fits in public service. I believe that um, it let, let's start with a review from parks slash forestry and then go from there. That'll be Is fine. Is council comfort, comfortable with that? If I could ask the clerks to take care of that for us, have um, scheduled that with Councilor Anderson and uh, Director Kearney and Dwayne Stahl from forestry. That'll be great. Anything else on that topic, Councilor Aguilar? No, this oh, is a new, new topic. topic. Go for it. 
Uh, for the past two years, the um, it was the Monday after Thanksgiving and uh, Christmas. We did not usually hold our, our in fourth informational of the month. And because Christmas and uh, does fall on a Tuesday, I was wondering what our plans are for this year. You know, you have you have been canceling meetings right and left, Councilor Aguilar. <laughs> I'm the calendar girl this year. <laughs> yeah, you are. Uh, just for your information, the uh, meeting that would have been Christmas Day would have then been 20, the 26th. We have canceled that meeting. If it's the desire of the council to cancel, are you saying the Tuesday after Thanksgiving? Well, so, in the past, we always did cancel because it was the fourth. Because it was the Monday, yeah, right. the fourth Thoughts, Monday we canceled. From the council? Do you care about the Tuesday after Thanksgiving? We don't care, or we don't want to meet. I'm getting shaking heads. I think that we would have to let uh, Lincoln County and Minnehaha County know as soon as possible if we were canceling, in case they had business to bring before us. Yeah, I guess my. Um, gut reaction because we'll be missing a couple um, later, the ones in December and possibly the one right after New Year's. Um, my gut reaction is to hold it for now. Let's see what's coming on the schedule. I'm kind of speaking to clerks and nebulously here. Let's see what's coming on the schedule if, there's, if there are things happening that we really need to do. Um, we'll, we'll meet, if we need to meet with the counties, we'll meet. Um, but let's kind of keep it as a we'd rather not kind of situation if we could, Lori. Thank you. Thank you. Any other open discussion? Any other meetings you want to cancel? No, <laughs> Councilor Jameson. I've got a, a map here that I'm going to give a give one to each of the council members. I need a little help on a project. <clears throat> okay. If you are all familiar with the uh, fire station on 69th Street, number four, it's uh, near 69th and Louise. Uh, I've known about. <clears throat> a uh, lack of a uh, local neighborhood park in this area. You know that half mile distance between each doorstep that we all want to achieve. Um, ever since I've been on the council, I've been aware of this gaping hole in our system. And uh, a local resident made it painfully obvious again to me the other day. And so with the help of uh, the Parks Department, they put a map together of this area that shows this hole and uh, there's been a couple of recent transactions in the area that have new landowners which has probably been what's keeping any development from occurring and the most recent one is 69th and Louise so uh, we may need to well I just need some help probably because uh, it's really been a, a, a void in our in our district my district southwest district and we may need some help figuring out how to, f how to make a solution work, but I want to give you a map so you can see the, uh, the void and maybe together we could get a local park built in that neighborhood. Hmm. Comments or questions for Councilor Jameson? Always like parks. Good, thank you. Giant maps, that'll be great. Any other open discussion from Council? Councilor Anderson. Yes, um, I think the whole council has been invited, uh, but I would like to invite the public tomorrow at 4 o'clock at 900 West 11th Street, uh, where the old Hardee's used to be. Uh, there will be a ribbon-cutting grand opening of uh, a new addition to the music community in Sioux Falls. Uh, it will be called the Brennan Academy of Music, and it is a cooperation between uh, a, a local business and the Boys Club, Girls Club of Sioux Falls. And this facility will enable children who may never be able to afford music lessons to be able to learn music. It uh, does not say it's rock or country or any type of music, but they hope to have local musicians teach children uh, they have hired uh, Corey Van Sickle to be the uh, director of the facility, <coughs> and the owners of the building have donated the building to Youth Enrichment Boys Club Girls Club and are creating a foundation to run this uh, project for many years. I think it will be a great addition to our city and especially the music community. 
once again, it is at 4 o'clock, and everyone is welcome. Good. Thank you, Councillor Anderson. Any questions for Councillor Anderson? Any other open discussion? I would like to briefly report on what I was doing last week with the South Dakota Municipal League. You know how much I en enjoy going to meeting after meeting after meeting, but uh, it was an interesting week. I appreciate the uh, latitude to be able to go. As you know, I, the Municipal League bylaws require that Sioux Falls have a presence on the board for the Municipal League, and so I am that person for us. Uh, the board met on Tuesday night last week while you all were meeting, and um, then we went through policy meetings, and many of you have participated in those policy committees during August, and then Councillor Entman came up and participated in the committee that didn't meet in August, so that he was available for that. Uh, the, the key thing for us, for Municipal League, we know that it's a lot of, of the small communities in, in Sioux Falls, but the key thing for us is the lobbying power that the, the South Dakota Municipal League has for us. And those policies then help frame that lobbying conversation with legislators. And so it was important to us to have several things included in those policies. The things that Sioux Falls wanted did pass into the, into the policy list, so it was a, a good week for us. Um, in particular, um, um, wastewater regionalization, uh, support of, of legislation to make that a little easier, to make that work in a, in a regional way. Um, one of the things that Councillor Entman advocated, the um, making permanent the half, half penny tourism sales tax, that has become part of municipal league policy. And my favorite thing that happened was on the, uh, I'm on the, uh, Councillor Entman and I are both on the public health safety and welfare committee and we did not bring this up but another member of the South Dakota Municipal League brought forward the idea of encouraging the South Dakota legislature to uh, reduce distracted driving in the state and so the texting ban has made it into the South Dakota Municipal League policies and it was kind of exciting to see that come from outside of Sioux Falls and from one of the smaller communities so it was a good week a fruitful week if you're interested in what those policies are they are they will be on the Municipal League web website which is sdmunicipalleague.org and if you have questions I'm available later on or by email or whatever so that is my report thank you for allowing me to go we're going to move on from open discussion to start our presentations with the event center con contract discussion Mike Cooper director of planning and building services Good afternoon. Yes, that's who I am. And I will start this off today. Tonight on the council agenda, we have two resolutions that we're going to be asking for approval. One is to um, authorize a facilities management agreement with SMG. And the second one will be a food and beverage services agreement with Ovations. So we thought it was worth time today to give you more of an overview of the process that we've been working on for a number of months to get to where we are tonight. And hopefully you will um, authorize those two agreements to go forward. So today we have a number of folks um, that will be making this presentation with me. But to start out with, I want to just recognize our contract negotiation team, which consisted of city staff, Karen Leonard with the attorney's office, Tracy Turbeck, Tom Huber, Scott Rust with finance, uh, myself, Kendra Simmonsa with the mayor's office, and then our chief negotiator and drafter of the agreements, who you'll hear from later today, is Jim Wiedewick with the Woods Fuller Law Firm. We also have our consultants present today that have helped us through this process from the beginning to the end, hopefully. Uh, Susan Seeger with Crossroads Consulting Services, from the warm community of Tampa, Florida, and from the Bigelow companies in Kansas City, Gloria Pinkerton, and she also, uh, her, one of her cohorts that helped us was Chris Bigelow. And then finally, we have representation today from our two management companies, uh, representing SMG, Terry Torkelson as general manager, and Gary McEnany as vice president of finance. And then representing Ovations today, Jay Polkinghorn, General Manager, and then Steve Gogorski, the Senior Vice President of Business Development. So we will hear from a number of those folks today as part of our overall presentation. Uh, we do have hard copies of this over on the table, and you have a hard copy, and we've also will have this on the website, obviously. Uh, today we're just going to do a general overview, including the timeline 
and the process, some key observations of both agreements, um, a more detailed review of the facilities management agreement, as well as the food and beverage services agreement, um, a little bit more information about some financial information, and then our two management teams um, will come up and talk to you about how wonderful they're going to be working together for us. And then we'll finally, finally, uh, give some time finally for, for some Q&A. So to start with, we'll bring up Susan to talk about our timeline and process. I will give technology a try. Good afternoon. Uh, as Mike said, I really just want to go through the process. And Susan Seeger with Crossroads Consulting. Uh, and just, why, just by way of background, I actually started my career in private management and uh, then worked for KPMG for 15 years in sports consulting and then started my own firm about six years ago. So I've been in this industry my entire career. But as Mike mentioned, what we wanted to talk about was timeline and process. And why I think that's important is for any good outcome, you really need to have a detailed, well thought out process, and particularly in the beginning. So I think when we started this, the city thought it was a somewhat optimistic process to uh, start in March and finish by the end of the summer, essentially with the uh, selection and then moving forward to the agreement. So in March of 2012, uh, that's when the RFPs were issued. And I think this was a unique process also in that at the same time, because of existing contracts, you're allowed to go through management and food and beverage services simultaneously. And um, I really think that you came out with the best deal for both of those, certainly financially. Um, but having said that, what was important was when the, when the RFP was issued, that it was carefully outlined what the objectives for the city were. And your staff put a lot of time and effort and thought into that. Uh, we interviewed the shortlisted firms in May. In between there, there were several uh, iterations of follow-up questions. And then I think another important piece was after the interview process, we did best and final offers. And we'll go through that uh, on the next slide, but uh, both of your firms submitted those and uh, certainly was very beneficial to the city from a financial perspective, but also saying, yeah, we want to be your partner in this. This is a good opportunity. Um, so, as Mike said, we've selected SM SMG Innovations. June through September was the contract negotiations, which I'm sure your entire staff and Jim are very happy that have come to a conclusion. Um, obviously, tonight is to approve those agreements and then your management team to start on January 1st. Uh, one question that certainly came up was, this is a unique process. We did select two separate companies, each of which have partners that could do the other service. Um, but really, both of them are used to working in this environment. So um, this, this appears unique, but I'm comfortable that both of these teams are top notch and that both of them are probably going to push each other to give you the best service and best financial performance at your facilities. Um, the other thing is I really think this process allowed you to leverage the assets of both the public sector and the private sector, again, to maximize um, really where you want to be as a facility. I touched on in the last slide, but really there were some key priorities that the city wanted to accomplish in this, in this process. Um, and there were stated objectives that you wanted to, one, you wanted to have your company react to, and secondly, you wanted to make sure we're incorporated in your contract. Obviously, consolidating operations under one company, um, providing pre-opening and grand opening services, which I know you've already benefited from both companies providing input throughout the, uh, the construction design process. I think one of the key areas was really there was, the, there was a stress on developing and executing a marketing plan and a strategy that not only attracted events, but also put your team in, tar in charge of creating new events. This isn't going to be status quo. You're making a big investment in a wonderful facility in a perfect setting. So you really want to push them. And you push them by asking for that in their proposal and incorporating it in your agreement. Obviously, you want to, you want to, uh, you want to run these facilities in a first-class manner and, and minimize the operating subsidy. Uh, I think some of the things that are very good in the agreement are that it really outlines the type of reporting that you expect because you want accountability, you want transparency. So these 
sample reports that are in the agreement are in the exact, they, they include the exact categories you want and will make it an easy transition. The other factor is you don't want to rest on your laurels and the management teams will tell you, um, you know, this is a five-year contract that is, uh, that can be ended at three years. So it's not like you have a 10-year contract. Uh, they really need to start performing January 1st and continue to perform as they have before, but actually step it up a notch. So I think the length of the contract is a very good term, and we did explore different contract terms throughout the process. I talked about the best and final offer. This really resulted in some significant savings for the city. In fact, it was about $50,000 annually on just the base fee that it saved you by going through this process. So just as a snapshot, what you paid last year or in fiscal year 2011 was about 200,000 for your base fee, another 65,000 for your incentives, so about 265,000. Uh, this year it's about 277,000 total fee. And in your first year, you're paying 200,000 for all of the facilities. Um, and even after the new event center opens, you're paying 210,000. So you're paying less than you are now. And I think that that is, again, a statement of the partnership and the belief that they can produce these revenues. Um, the other is that in some processes, you'll see management companies will actually charge you extra for kind of the pre-opening services or grand opening. Um, and your team really negotiated this into the contract. The incentive fee, this is, this is key. Um, it, it can be a significant part, it can be equal to the base, up to $100,000 in year one. But your team really fought um, to make sure that it is very quantitative in nature. So again, the common theme of we want to make sure that you're producing as a team managing our asset. So they have to achieve total revenues greater than a mutually agreed upon budgeted amount to even be eligible for incentive. So if they don't produce what they said in the beginning of the year, then they're not eligible for the incentive. The other, as I said, is that you really fought hard, and this was an increase over the orig original submission, that 75% of this is earned, meaning it's quantitative in nature. So only 25% of the potential incentive is more qualitative in nature. But even within that, 50% is customer service based and 50% is city performance. So you're really still having control over that, um, which is a unique strategy in that I think even in the qualitative, you're making sure it's performance based. So the agreement clearly articulates what your expectations are. Uh, this still is a partnership and um, it's performance based and obviously, and Jim's gonna go into this in much more detail, was instrumental in making sure this occurred, but that it's compliant with IRS regulations relative to tax exempt financing. Next we'll hear from Gloria Pinkerton with the Bigelow Companies to talk about overview of the food and beverage services. Good afternoon. I'm Gloria Pinkerton from the Bigelow Companies, and we are food and beverage consultants for the convention center arena and stadium businesses throughout the country and actually the world now. And we were working through Crossroads for the food and beverage consulting and worked on the RFP and then reviewed all of the proposals when they came in. We did receive three proposals, one from Levy Restaurants, Savor, the division of SMG, and Ovations, the division of Global. And Levy was, we did not interview them. Their financial proposal was much lower than the other two we received, so they were eliminated before we ever went any further with the presentations. And at the presentations, it was just real clear, I think, to the whole evaluation committee that Ovations was just a notch above what SAVER could do. One of the things that we put in the RFP was that we wanted this to be a first-class venues and felt that Ovations stepped up to that first-class reputation and could really bring to the city the type of operation that you were looking for. They're currently operating the convention center, doing an excellent job with the catering there, and 
food is really important in a convention center setting to help bring business. So to continue them over would be more profitable for the city. Um, a few of the things that Ovations provided was their Everything's Fresh campaign, which they will probably talk to you about. Um, they're probably, they were the first in the business to actually not pre-wrap all their food and give it to you, but actually take it straight from a grill, even in a concession stand, and serve your customers fresh food. They also have a new convention center option where guests can actually order for their banquet instead of actually having to just eat what one person decided they should have. Their pricing was much more in line with what we felt your customer would like. And just one example, a gallon of coffee that was projected for Savor that they would charge was $55 a gallon, Ovations was 26 And there were other pricing that, again, we felt Ovations pricing was more in line with the customer that you will have. Um, the food and beverage contract, and I'm sure Jim will address this, is based on they will pay the city a percentage of their sales. And it is all written out in the contract. And when Susie talked about the best and final offer that was asked for, Ovations did step up. And as a result of that final offer is probably over five years, going to bring an additional $500,000 in revenue to the city. And we have projected, based on projected sales for the next five years, that that blended commission rate will be 36.6% of their total sales. That's all I have. Thank you. Okay, our next presenter will be Jim Wiederich, representing Woods Fuller. Good afternoon. I'm Jim Wiederich with the uh, law firm of Woods Fuller, Schultz & Smith, and I'm pleased to uh, be here as a presenter today uh, in front of the City Council. Uh, as you are aware, I had the opportunity to work on the, uh, the design contract, the construction contract uh, for the event center, and then the namings rights contract, uh, the title sponsorship agreement. And I would say that, uh, that with these two agreements, uh, they are they are significant agreements in the overall package of what is uh, going to be happening with the facilities. But as far as easy reading and a wow factor in the contracts, these aren't it. <laughs> they were uh, they were tedious uh, negotiations, uh, very detailed. Uh, they went quite well, but uh, the, this this is heavy reading that I would not encourage anybody to do right before you wanted to go to bed at night. Uh, let me go through the, uh, the facilities then. Our, first, we'll start with the facility management agreement. The facility management agreement, as you are aware, is for the first time going to cover um, four facilities. And uh, it involves the Sioux Falls Arena, the Sioux Falls Convention Center, Orpheum Theater, and then the Denny Sanford Premier Center. I think what's important in regard to uh, the Premier Center is that uh, there are there was an opportunity for both SMG and Ovations to review the design and to make sure that as they went through um, the uh, negotiation process and as your design team went through uh, with designing the facility that there be as much coordination as possible so that we don't end up in a situation where the equipment doesn't fit or we're missing things as part of the plan. So it was very important that that those companies, even though they weren't under contract yet, stepped up as part of the process and met with your facilities design committee on numerous occasions to uh, make sure that there was a coordinated effort. The, uh, the important thing also uh, on this slide is that SMG manages the food and beverage operator contract for the city. So in that regard, uh, SMG actually serves as an agent for the city. And it takes some of that day-to-day -day burden off 
with having to uh, interact and in, in marketing, in management, in service to the customer, all of that gets coordinated and worked through to the two companies. And uh, the, what happens then is that the city really uh, steps back and has final authority, but is not uh, working with uh, the folks that are on the ground on a day-to-day -day basis. The term of the contract then is uh, five years beginning with January 1, 2013. Uh, the city uh, may terminate early on December 31, uh, 2015. That is a provision that ties in with the IRS regulations which allows the city uh, in the private and public uh, bond arrangement that you have in place a one-time opportunity to terminate on an early basis without uh, risking uh, loss of the tax exempt status on those portions of the bonds that are tax exempt. We were able to include that in this negotiation and it, it really as, uh, as Susan mentioned earlier kind of puts the the burden then on SMG to perform right out of the uh, right out of the chute starting on January 1 of 2013 and uh, we have no doubt but that they will uh, at that point. The transaction structure then is different for the two companies. Uh, what, uh, what we need to uh, remember then with respect to SMG is that the city bears the risk and reaps the rewards of the revenue that comes in on, uh, on the rental of the facilities, the management of the facilities. Uh, the IRS restrictions require this approach. All operating revenues flow to the city. All operating costs flow from the city and SMG simply receives a management fee and is not sharing in the net profit or the loss. Uh, so uh, in spite of that, with the fact that you have an out in three years, if you're not, you know, that, that puts significant pressure on SMG to produce uh, over the next few years because if, if you're not hitting your profit projections or minimizing your loss projections uh, in the early years, uh, there is uh, the opportunity for the city to, to decide that you're going to switch management companies. And then, of course, as long as you have assumed the profit and loss obligation, you also have the repair and maintenance obligation uh, for the facilities. Uh, SMG has agreed to make a capital infusion of $275,000 to be used at the city's discretion for operations, pre-opening, grand opening, expenses, et cetera. That money goes into the operating account and then the contract has with it a number of uh, requirements that uh, at certain points along the way, the SMG needs to come with a marketing plan for the opening, the grand opening and pre-opening services, et cetera. And also then uh, there will be plans for capital improvements that can be made to all the facilities based upon that, in, that capital infusion uh, from SMG. And, and that money is, uh, is all due then on January 1, right up front. It doesn't come in over time. Uh, the management fees are on a graduated basis. Uh, uh, they amount to a 2.5% increase on a simple interest basis over the five-year period. The quantitative fee uh, can be no more than 75% of the base fee, and that's pursuant to IRS regulation. Uh, well, the, the combination of the quantitative and qualitative together cannot exceed the base fee for an annual uh, for any given year. So those fees have, uh, have all been negotiated, as Susan had indicated, uh, and were very favorable uh, for the city. The incentive fees then, uh, the quantitative fee, is the difference between uh, if, if actual adjusted total event revenue exceed budgeted adjusted total event revenue, then the quantitative fees are earned. And, uh, the, what we mean by event revenue is all of the revenue that comes in uh, through the operating account uh, for the events that are held out there. And the adjustment is that the, everything that's going into the operating account is, is not solely within SMG's control. 
So in order to tie to performance for SMG, we back out for purposes of determining whether they've earned the quantitative uh, fee, we back out the Legends sponsorship revenue, the premium seating revenue, and the naming rights revenue. Doesn't mean you don't get the revenue, it just means it's not part of the calculation. Then with the qualitative fees that are earned, if the, it's the same, if actual adjusted total event revenue exceed budgeted adjusted total event revenue, then there is the possibility of earning qualitative fees, but then the city decides whether SMG has met customer and city event diversity, asset management, operations, satisfaction goals. So those are, those are qualitative in that they are more subjective, but there will be surveys completed as part of that process, at least on the customer side. Uh, the next slide I, I've already covered, and that was the definition of the adjusted total event revenue. I won't go over that again. So are there any questions on the SMG contract before we turn to the food and beverage contract? Questions from Council. Councilor Antman. Just one. Mm -hmm. If you might just clarify again, on the last uh, part of your presentation, you said the adjusted total event revenues would subtract off the Legends sponsorship um, that they sell the premium seating and what was the third T the naming rights the naming rights thank you because all of those uh, funds will be going into the operating account from those other uh, contracts thank you Councillor Staggers yes um, you mentioned the SMG capital infusion of two hundred and seventy five thousand dollars and later on I suspect you're going to mention ovations of six hundred and forty thousand dollars correct I guess I'm a little concerned about how this came about. If I was SMG, I don't think I would be eager to say, I'm going to give you $275,000, or ovations, I'm going to give you $640,000. Uh, I don't want to use the phrase, but to really illustrate my concern is, is this, I know it's not a shakedown, but I mean. Is it standard in the industry? Well, it, it might be standard, I don't know, but it just doesn't seem the right thing to do. Well, first of all, I, I, and Susan and Gloria could probably uh, address it more from an industry standpoint, but it is my understanding that it would be standard in the industry for the management company and food and beverage to provide those capital incentives. To be quite honest, uh -huh. the, there, there's always a balance between uh, the fees that are earned or the income that is earned by ovations or SMG and the capital that they are willing to give back. So if on the one hand you were to say that there, were, uh, that there will be no capital infusion up front, then in all likelihood you would be negotiating a different percentage of compensation uh, because it's a zero-sum game. You know, everybody knows that there are certain profit margins that each of these companies will want to reach yes. in, in their respective uh, uh, <laughs> service industries. And so it, the, the fact that they're providing some of this cash up front means that the percentages, in all likelihood, are, are adjusted to take that into account on a long-term basis. Mm -hmm. No, I, I, I can understand that, but the appearance of, you know, this is, uh, it just, yeah. Susan, you want to address that? It, it does appear, as you say. But, mm -hmm. um, you know, times have changed, and this um, industry management has become very competitive as well. Frankly, this is a marquee account for any management company to be involved in because there are not a lot of new facilities under construction. And, um, you know, as a consultant, and not because you're my client, but, you know, this is a really good opportunity to have a new arena, a convention center, a hotel, a theater, everything you have going is, is that's a good package. But more importantly, why companies have started doing this, and it's very common, um, and it's usually done, one, under their own, um, wherewithal where it hasn't been asked as part of an RFP and it's another where municipalities are trying to get some extra upfront capital to maybe reduce debt a little bit but more common um, 
this is, you know, the city can use however it deems appropriate. But in a lot of instances, it, it is used to help make your grand opening even better so that, you, you know, you don't have to worry about that. And or when we talked about one of the keys was to diversify and create new, new events as a result of this building. It helps give them the ability to do that. So um, it can be looked at any way you want, but kind of it can be a marketing fund that doesn't, um, that doesn't put the city at risk. It's actually putting your management team at risk through this money. And I think that's one of the key advantages. So you maybe can buy an act that you wouldn't otherwise maybe want a chance. So it gives you a lot of opportunities, but it's really more meant to help you on a marketing perspective in this instance. If I could just uh, say one more thing. Okay, SMG is giving us 275000 Well, then one has to wonder, what if another company like Ovations would say, we'll give you a million? Uh, would that have tipped everything towards Ovations? Um, in, in other words, this is refrain. a way to kind yep. of buy and, and it. Jim's absolutely right. Um, when we started the process, both the management companies offered upfront capital commitment, mm -hmm. differing yeah. levels differing management fees, I mean, it's definitely related in what you offer up front and, and how that uh, translates throughout the contract. It was the same with the food service companies. So, you know, in essence, though, they're banking on their own ability to produce because, uh, you know, as Jim said, that's money you're getting on day one up front. Mm -hmm. So they're going to have to also help the city leverage how to best use that that meets everybody's objectives. So... Um, Everyone gave one, um, so it wasn't, you know, it wasn't just like they did. But, you know, they, this, it, it is a bottom line. You know, you're not going to get the million dollars. If you, if you get the million dollars, it's clearly going to be a loan, and you're going to pay for it over the course of the contract, um, which actually in some, in some examples, that's what the municipality needs. They need the upfront, and they're willing to pay more over time because that's what helps make their deal more successful to them and their, their constituents. So th these types of capital commitments are done for different reasons and at differing levels. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Councilor Jamison. Oh, thank you. Uh, Jim or Susan, I'm not sure who might be able to best answer this, but I get the idea of what it costs for the city to have these uh, management companies operate uh, the facilities for us, but in this research and in these uh, negotiations, did you ever figure out and is it fair to share? Oh, by the way, I do like the shakedown. I think that was a very good job on your part and the city's part. Um, did you ever figure out or calculate how much these folks will make? Is there a fair industry standard to say that, you know, by all accounts, yes, the city may pay two hundred thousand dollars for the operation of the all these facilities to SMG, but they have a chance to make this much money? Did you guys figure that out? Is that even fair to share? <laughs> Same with ovations. I, I, I don't recall that we were able to run any calculations because uh, on the, at least on the ovation side, we don't know what their profit margin is. Uh, we know what, what we will earn on that, but I can't tell you what their net might be. Uh, likewise with SMG, there are, there are revenue opportunities in, in the event of selling tickets that we do not have that information. So do we know what their total bottom line is? No. Okay, I'm going to... Well I mean, what you're doing, though, in this instance, is you are setting your risk, and you know that you're paying. This is... No matter how good everybody does, this is what you're getting. But really, in this particular deal, you are going to be the beneficiary. So they are certainly going to potentially get other money from ticket deals and what they negotiate, but it's still going to benefit you, the city, on those deals because you're only out the 200 maximum, the 200,000 up to 225 or what it is. Same thing with ovations. You hope they sell twice as much as they said because they're only getting that percentage, you're getting the rest. So, you know, you don't know what it is, but you know what your risk is. Okay. We're, thank you, Susan. I appreciate it. We're going to go ahead with the rest of the presentation, and we'll do questions later. If I go could ahead, just Mike. come back 
just to clarify, because I think I misspoke last time, this is all the revenue that SMG will get from the facility, is what we paid them. Ovations will get revenue based on their commission. So, and we'll come back to that. Yeah. Go ahead, Jim. Other questions if, if, if on I SMG's contract? I just ask a contract? quick question okay. about the Council tickets. Staggers. You want me to go for it? Yeah. The tickets, uh, I mean, there's a, seems like a great potential for SMG to make a lot of money off the ticket sales. And, and I'm kind of surprised that there's nothing in this contract dealing with tickets. Why isn't there any? I mean, they could maybe charge really very high prices and that could affect our operations and Mike Cooper would you address this please <clears throat> thank you Jim okay I'll go back one more time this is the revenue that SMG will qualify for with this contract all the other revenue from the facility rentals and tickets would only be shared with the city so again and it will have SMG innovations come up here as part of the presentation to help clarify that. So if we could get through the whole presentation, then we'll be glad to try to come back to those questions. Thank you. I'm stopping all questions from council now. Let's move ahead with the presentation, please. Then let's turn to the food and beverage uh, services agreement. As with uh, the SMG contract, it covers the same four facilities. So let's turn then to the next slide. We have the same uh, term that we have with, uh, with the SMG contract. They run concurrently for the five-year period starting January 1, 2013. The transaction structure is different for Ovations than it is for SMG. For Ovations, they bear the risk and they reap the rewards, the, uh, which means that Ovations pays commissions to the city on gross receipts. Ovations assumes all the obligations under the direct operating cost that they have running the food service. They assume repair and maintenance costs on a per item basis up to $2,500 per item. And the city would assume any repair maintenance obligations over the $2,500 per item. Then the commission rates uh, run depending upon which of the facilities you're talking about. Uh, run from uh, 42 to 50 percent for concessions, catering at 31.5 to 33, suites and loge seats 10 to 30 percent, club seats 5 to 35 uh, percent. Overall commission rate, as Susan had indicated in her presentation, is 36.6 percent over the five-year agreement. The capital infusion from Ovations is 640,000. Some of it comes in during phase one in 2013 for convention center upgrades. Some of it comes in in the form of a grand opening marketing expenses. And then the balance will be event center upgrades uh, for uh, equipment uh, necessary to operate the, uh, uh, the new event center once completed. Uh, there is a buyout obligation if the agreement terminates early for any reason. The city will need to pay ovations the unamortized amount of the capital investment on a straight line basis. And then the last slide has to do with the liquor license. Ovations has already in place a liquor license because it operates the convention center. And it purchased, as I understand it, that liquor license for $160,000. When the agreement terminates, uh, Ovations is obligated to return that liquor license to the city without compensation. So it reverts back to the city and the city can use it again then with the next food and beverage company that they might hire to uh, provide food and beverage services in these facilities. That is all I have for my presentation. Uh, I think Mike wants to turn it over then to the next speaker. Let's do that. We're going to go ahead and finish the presentation. Uh, next, I wanted to have Tracy Turbeck, our finance director, just talk about the, the 2013 budget. And again, this is not uh, including the event center, but we just wanted to give you kind of an overview of at least what you approve for next year. Thank you, Mike. Tracy Turbeck with the finance office. And there, uh, the, the slide here shows the projected revenues, and these uh, were essentially negotiated numbers with SMG 
uh, between the SM, uh, SMG uh, uh, finance people and the city finance office. Um, really two points I'd like to make with this slide. One is to emphasize for you the importance of the food and beverage revenues to the city. You can see uh, for 2013, out of total revenues for the facilities, uh, we're, we've budgeted, uh, or SMG has budgeted $1.4 million uh, to come to the city in the form of net, uh, net revenues from the food and beverage sales. That's uh, well above 30, or well above one third of, of what our uh, total revenues are projected to be at 3.8 million. The other, the other point I wanted to make from this is really to, to put a little uh, more perspective on the incentive fees that SMG is in, entitled to earn. Uh, you've you've uh, heard uh, a couple of different people speak to that already. Um, essentially, the, uh, <clears throat> the incentive fees, as was mentioned, uh, are based upon the revenues generated from the facilities, not uh, on, on the share of the net profits uh, or losses. And as Jim mentioned uh, earlier, that's, that's really driven by the IRS rules on, on private use of the facility. In order to be eligible for the incentive fees, uh, the, the facilities must generate revenues at least equal to SMG's revenue budget. So for 2013, they will, SMG will not be eligible for incentive fees unless we have total revenues of at least $3.8 million. So if we don't hit that mark with our revenues, the maximum the city would pay is just their base, base fee. The calculation of the, uh, the quantitative portion of the incentive fee uh, is calculated based on the excess revenues. So any revenues over and, over and above $3.8 million SMG retains or will receive in the form of an incentive fee 15 percent. So they'll get 15 cents of every dollar over and above 3.8 million that are generated from the operation of the facility. That maxes out when it hits 75 percent of the base fee or in, in the case of 2013 when that incentive amount hits $75,000. So that's the most they can earn from the what's in, in the contract is referred to as the earned incentive fee. There's also a qualitative portion that Jim talked about, a qualitative incentive fee, but again, they, they don't, uh, SMG will not qualify for those qualitative incentive fees unless we hit that $3.8 million mark in revenues in 2013. If we hit that or exceed it, then they will, will qualify for up to another $25,000 of incentive fees based on an evaluation of the quality of service, both from their customers and uh, quality, uh, evaluations that will be done by the city. So I'm hoping that uh, adds a little, a little different perspective, maybe puts a little more meat on the bone in terms of how those incentive fees will, be, uh, will work and will be calculated. Thank you. Good. Thank you, Tracy. Our last presenters are the representatives of both SMG and Ovations, and we asked them to come up today and kind of address, um, first of all, what are some unique efforts that they'll be utilizing in the short term to maximize utilization and financial performance of our existing facilities prior to the opening of the new event center. Second of all is how will the two companies work together when the events center does open, even though they are somewhat in competition. And then finally, what type of a transition process are they going to put in place for uh, existing employees and also ensuring a transition as we go forward into the next year. So both Terry and Jay will be coming up to address these. Good afternoon. Terry Torkelson, General Manager, Sioux Falls Arena and Orpheum Theater. Um, I'll start out with the marketing side uh, as it's a pretty much the key component in this whole process. Uh, as part of our bid, we did put together an actual marketing plan. Uh, if you'd like, I can go through it. It's 168 pages long. Um, it's got to be considered a document that's constantly being worked on. I mean, it's, to have a marketing plan and just say, here you go, this is what we're going to do, won't work. So this document will constantly change. It will change in conjunction with our partnership with uh, Sanford and Premier. As part of that deal, they have the rights to uh, work with us to make this fit what both the city wants 
as well as meets their needs as well. So you won't only have our marketing expertise, you'll have theirs as well. When it comes to one of the questions we received was unique ways we were marketing the facility uh, in the interim before the uh, new building opens. That new building has actually given us a unique opportunity in the fact that we are getting to talk to people who we really haven't talked to before in doing the pre-sale on that. So by doing that and talking about the large square footage we have for whether it be a convention, it's getting us our foot in the door to allow us to speak to them about their big convention, but it's also allowing us to talk about some of the smaller ones that they may not have considered us before. Um, in talking with promoters about the new building, um, some of the ones who haven't been in the market before and haven't been very excited about it, uh, one of them being Icon uh, Entertainment. Uh, we were having preliminary discussions, explaining the new building, talking to them about bringing events. Jeff Dunham, which is happening uh, in February, tickets go on sale this weekend, for those of you who are interested, um, came out of that. Just conversations about what we have to offer. Another thing we would like to do is start creating new events. I think our RibFest event shows that we can do that. Uh, we've done it very successfully for the last 15 years. Um, some of our other facilities have events like winter fests, uh, kids events, things like that to, to, to bring the community in and see their facility and see what we have to offer, but also to generate revenue. Um, so uh, as an overall marketing, um, the facility is very unique. You've got two arenas, a convention center, and then downtown we have the Orpheum Theater. So in, in not many markets do you see that. Um, we as a company manage 50 theaters, uh, 65 or 68 convention centers, 75 arenas, and then stadiums, equestrian centers, et cetera. Well, we have networks for each one of those divisions, for conventions, for theaters, and for arenas. But they don't work standalone. They work together. An example would be on our convention center side, we have something called Site Pass, where, say, McCormick Place in Chicago gets a lead. They're busy that week. They can't host it. It goes out to all the other SMG facilities. It's one of the things that's unique to our company. We share leads. Um, we work very closely with convention and visitors bureaus. We've actually um, started a new program in Detroit where it's a partnership with the CVB. Um, they actually have access to our calendar and can actually work to book the building with us in conjunction. Uh, Kenny actually has been to Detroit. I think he has seen what that has brought to fruition in a a very declining economy. So um, down the road, if you're interested in more things about our marketing plan, feel free to ask questions. If you have specific questions today, be more than happy to answer them. Um, but when it comes to some of the marketing opportunities, when it comes to food and beverage, Jay is going to address a few of those. Good. Thank you, Terry. <clears throat> Good afternoon. Jay Pokinghorn with Ovation Food Service. Uh, just continuing on the marketing uh, discussion. Uh, some of the things that we have done at the convention center um, for the past five years as well as going forward in the new contract. Uh, our philosophy is it's all about the experience. Um, it's easy to tell people what you do and that you're good at it, but really uh, the best way of doing that is bring them in, let them experience the food, the atmosphere, the service. So we've created a couple events to do just that. Uh, to briefly touch on them, Christmas and July, uh, we bring event planners in in the month of July. We decorate the ballroom as if it was uh, a December or January event. Christmas trees, uh, we bring in live entertainment, uh, music, as well as showcase our entire uh, holiday menu. Uh, so we'll have, we'll have up to 10, 15 different entrees for them to, to try out. We'll have the upsell uh, opportunity packages there as well. And really let them get a feel of what the event would be like uh, if, they, if they chose us. Uh, same type of thing, the mock weddings. We work with our wedding showcase um, events. Uh, they allow us to hold a, a mock wedding in conjunction with their event. Uh, we bring in brides and grooms. They can sit down. They sample uh, food. They see the up lights. They see the decoration. They, they have the trust then of what their event would look like um, with us. Uh, some of the other things, Taste the Difference and Taste the Possibilities, uh, was actually created here in Sioux Falls at the Convention Center. 
Um, again, we, this is a smaller scale. We bring in um, eight to 10 people, bring them into the kitchen. We uh, serve them anywhere from five to 10 courses. Usually they have to go out in a wheelchair uh, afterwards. But uh, again, it's all about the experience. Uh, we show them exactly what we do. Uh, we just don't tell them what we do. So, um, and then Sales Blitz is, uh, is up there on, on the screen as well. Uh, saturate different markets at different uh, times of the uh, year. And of course, again, we, uh, we bring food. That way they, uh, they'll let our sales team uh, come in and talk to them. So um, I think that's it for that one. Um, going on to the customer experience, uh, just kind of the process that our event planners have with us from sales process through the billing. Um, the, the first thing is one contract uh, between food and beverage and the building. All the terms and agreements are all in one contract. Uh, as seamless as possible, as hassle-free, uh, that's our goal um, and our focus. Uh, one contact, uh, every event has a dedicated, um, a dedicated event manager with them. They will uh, get all the details, compile it all, uh, get it out to the uh, building and the different uh, departments uh, that need to know. And uh, the one thing that our clients really like about our event managers and the process that we do is that same person that's detailing the event with them is there throughout the event, making sure that their event goes just as it was as planned. Um, one invoice, again, food and beverage uh, charges and building charges are all um, together and one invoice is out there. Uh, internally, we split that out uh, between SMG and Ovations. Uh, and then finally, we need to know how we're doing uh, through, the, through the guest eyes, so we send out one survey, again, with both building, AV, concessions, catering, uh, questionnaires, uh, to get that feedback as well. Um, and Terry will be talking about, um, from a fan and a guest experience, how they, how they view us. It's important to keep your meeting planners happy, obviously, and especially in the convention center industry. But the ones we, uh, in the arena side, will need to keep happy is our customers and our fans. It's not uncommon, as Susan said, to have multiple entities operate and run food and beverage. SMG has 228 accounts worldwide. Our food service division, Saver, does about 100 accounts. So we work with Ovations, we work with Levy, we work with Centerplate, Aramark, all of those companies. And in all of those accounts, the key is to make sure that fan experience is not only uh, a good one, but it's one where they don't know the difference. They may see a different logo here, they may see a different logo there, but as far as they're concerned, one entity is in control of the entire environment. It doesn't make sense for Jay and I to fight over things. If there is ever a case, there are provisions in the contract that will keep us from doing that. You know, a rising tide raises all ships. We're two companies that are profit driven. We also want to do what's best for our client. So as part of making the fans happy, we both have to do our jobs and we have to do it exceedingly well. Um, next up we have uh, our transition. Uh, both of our organizations have done this many, many, many times. Uh, transitioning accounts is not something that's new to any of us. We have both uh, national support, especially with our HR, uh, making sure the transition smooth with the bringing on of staff. We have every intent to transition the existing staff. Uh, we've already begun preliminary talks. Uh, we didn't want to lose any. Some people have chosen to leave and, and stay either with uh, Global Spectrum or go on to something different. That was their choice. Uh, but the rest of them, we realize they're an important asset to this community. So our, both our regional and local HR, uh, as well as uh, the national, will be involved in it. Uh, our operational assistance is one of the things that is uh, key to SMG's success. Uh, Michael Godoy at Corporate has been heavily involved in the event center process. He and uh, Tim Voigt, who is out of uh, Tulsa, one of the uh, facilities we're modeling both our marketing as well as our operational plan under, they have two arenas at a convention center, so it's a, a good fit. They will come up, help with the operational transition. Um, but one thing that's unique to this is it's not like Ovations doesn't know us in our facility and we don't know the convention center operationally. So this transition will actually be probably one of the easier ones for both companies. 
We've already started it. Uh, Carmen Giles, our food and beverage director, and Jay have met uh, on multiple occasions. I've met with Craig and his operations staff to talk about CIP projects, make sure the ball doesn't get dropped on anything. Uh, I think overall this will be one of the smoother transitions you will see when it comes to private management transitioning to other private management. Um, Jay will talk now about what uh, Ovations does. Um, just as with Terry, uh, obviously we'll have a lot of local and um, national transition help uh, and support. Uh, John Lachance, our regional vice president of operations, uh, will be with us frequently during that, those transition times as well as local and uh, corporate human resource support. Uh, we also have quite a few Midwest venues, uh, one that's pretty similar to what we're going into uh, down in Des Moines with the Wells Fargo arena and convention center there. Uh, so Michael Ransom, who's the GM down there, and some of his staff will be available to help uh, during the transition as well. Uh, down in Omaha, uh, Warner Park, uh, we'll have Ryan Slane and his, his team also available to help uh, support during those transition. Um, other than that, the, the full intent is to trans, uh, transition all the staff from the arena over um, to ovations and we'll go from there. I'd even like to add, uh, Jay was nice enough that we do our local training in September, both our food and beverage and operations staff together. Jay provided us with uh, uh, information on the company as well as uh, applications to provide to our food and beverage staff so they could go ahead and fill out the application and we're turning them over to uh, Jay so that we can get that ball rolling. He was gracious enough to do that. So. Great, good, thank you both. I know we're running over time, but this is a very important uh, issue for us today, and we wanted to make sure that you had all the information necessary for you to make the right decision tonight. But if I could, uh, if we could bring the two gentlemen back up here and maybe address the capital infusion and help clarify, less, particularly SMG, as far as the other revenue question, besides what the city would be paying in management fees, and if Jay wants to talk about that as well, if that would be okay. Well, then, um, Mike, just understand we're not running over time, that we're, okay. we're right on time. It's Very, okay. Thank you. Yes, and that we we're will. We're excited to tell you all this information. Yes, and council wants to know everything they possibly can. So let's go ahead and move forward. I'll make mine very brief. All we will make off this account is our incentive and our management fee. Tickets go to the promoter or the act. All that money goes to them. Um, any ticketing situation we negotiate with Ticketmaster, Tickets.com, whoever that may be, and we are going to open that up to bid, all that money comes to the city. All revenues flow to the city. The only thing we make are our management fee and our incentive. That's it. Okay. Um, maybe I should ask somebody else from the city, but so you're saying the city is not going to make any money off these tickets at all? Well, there's a public facility maintenance surcharge. Okay. charge on top of that but no when someone comes in and does an event like a concert that promoter is taking all the risk mm -hmm. if they don't sell tickets they're the one who loses all the money so when it comes to the ticket sales they're the ones that keep that to pay the act because if an act is two hundred and seventy five thousand dollars that's a lot of risk to take um, on your own so the promoter is the one who makes the revenue off the tickets yes unless it's a like rib fest and then all the revenue that's made from that it's a locally produced event. That all stays with the city. And then the city is going to charge how much then surcharge on a ticket? It's scaled um, below $8. I think it's uh, 75 cents and then above 30, it goes up to $2 and it's scaled in between. Okay. So there is that fee. Um, it's now going to flow to the building in the past it has flowed straight to the city uh, it's just a matter of an accounting um, that's it then terry would you address the capital infusion as well please sure i mean it, it makes sense for us to make the building successful and in the past we've always done capital infusions as well uh, we currently still have money left over in that account our marketing account i think it's close to sixty thousand dollars at the end of this contract it flows to the city if they want to leave it for doing events and helping co-promote market the building, that's great. If you want to build a road with it, you can't. It's your money. So it's not uncommon to do that. 
uh, especially when you have something like the new event center opening, where we know it's tough for cities to spend money on grand openings to go, oh my gosh, we have to spend $50,000 on this grand open ribbon cutting and give food away. It's easier for us to use money from our company to do that as well as Ovation's contribution as well. Other council questions for either Terry or for Jay, Councilor Jameson. I wanted to thank, uh, I think, Karen Leonard, Tracy Turbeck, Tom Huber, Scott Rust, Mike Cooper, and Kendra Simmons, and Jim Wiederich for all their work. I think they uh, did a fine job for us. You know, the, a couple of us counselors have been in here in the past where they've uh, renewed these agreements, and we really didn't understand what was put into making them happen. And, uh, you know, we're entering into an agreement that's five years. It's going to do kind of the same thing as had happened to us in the past that we were precluded from uh, voting on a new contract. So I think this decision that we make tonight is pretty serious because it does take it out of the hands of future council members. Um, I think a lot of the details are covered. The only one that I might have left is the roughly $900,000 of the capital infusion money. How is that uh, decided? I mean, could I call? Who gets to decide where that's going to be spent and how? I mean, it's a lot of money to be left up to the discretion of somebody. How is that covered? How is that decision process to spend money decided? Well, again, with each of the two proposals, they listed potential uses of the funds. In the case of SNG, it could be used for marketing, it could be used for pre opening. Um, and it, it would be at the discretion of the city administration to authorize the use of those funds. And in the case of Ovations, what they felt is that with this infusion of money, they could upgrade what is going to be initially proposed for the new event center that would allow even more potential revenue for food and beverage. So that's kind of the direction that we would work with Ovations is how we can upgrade even more um, the products, the, the services that would be available, the points of sale within the new event center. And again, that would be recommended by them and uh, approved by the city administration. So you will not see a specific line item by line item list of those funds, but it would be general categories that we would both agree would be beneficial to maximize the use and the revenue for the facilities. Councilor Rolfing. Thank you. Um, Terry, I have a question for you, sure. please. Um, got them all written down here someplace. First, um, what I'm hearing you say then is that you're going to pay for all your employees and everything with, with $200,000? No. Okay. No. All the expenses as Jim covered, borne by the facility are paid by the city. The fee is a management fee you're paying for our expertise both on the local level as well as the national level. That's where you get the, um, all the things we have like our SNG booking or entertainment division that has all the contacts. You're paying for that expertise to run your facility. Okay, and then, then you're going to, um, your incentive then is to get the extra $200,000. Uh, extra hundred is the $100, most. $100,000. Absolutely. And um, what control do we have? We have to approve your budget then on an annual basis. Absolutely. Through this, through this body. No. It goes through the normal budgetary it has process. Has to go through the council. Okay, right? Okay. Okay. Secondly, um, are you happy with that? Yes. Okay. Absolutely. You like having a cap on the amount of money you can make? Um, I mean, it's, it's part of the negotiated process. I think some of that has to do with the IRS regulations, too. We can't oh, earn okay. more than our incentive. We okay. can't earn more in incentive than we earn in management fee. So okay. if the IRS would change that rule, we'd be very happy. <laughs> <laughs> very good. Jim, I have a question for you. I apologize. I have read through all of these 
contracts, and it was a week and a half ago, <laughs> and I did not have a hard copy with me. I read it on my computer, and I, and I, so I could not, you know, as hard as I pushed on the screen, it would not underline. <laughs> um, and the whiteout wouldn't work and all that kind of stuff either. But it seems to me I read a part in, I believe it was SMG's contract, that said there was a place in there that the contract could be changed by the administration without approval of the council. Um, let me take a quick look at the management part. And it, um, there, was, there was a part that was different in, in uh, SMG's contract over ovations in a certain area that allowed them, allowed the, and it may be a, a, a part that was, um, and that's what I wanted to ask you, if there was one, if there was a part in there that allowed that to happen without council approval. And I apologize, I did not have time to go back and well, dig the, it out. The amendment part on SMG's contract under uh, section 13.3 states that this agreement may not be altered, modified, or amended in whole or in part except in writing executed by the city and SMG. So there's, there's no, within the contract itself, there's no designation as how that approval process is made within the city that's outside of the contract and subject to the operating procedures within the city. Let me look at SM or at uh, ovations. No, it was in a longer paragraph. It was is one of those where if something needs to happen and this happens and then this and this and this, um, this is the final um, uh, oh, this is the final thing that happens and we won't have to do anything else. Was that the dispute resolution process? Okay. And Under 14.1 of uh, Ovation's contract. Yeah, Ovation's, Ovation's. The city's decision will be final based on Ovation if it's not at... That may have been it. You know, and uh, I, I don't see the specific language you were seeking earlier. Uh, let me tell you about the intent of that provision. Uh, one of the things that, that we uh, worked on quite extensively in the negotiation process was the fact that we're expecting and, and we are hopeful that there will be tremendous cooperation between SMG and Ovations. They have to work together on a daily basis. Correct. They may not always agree on, on the details of a marketing approach, or they might, not dis or they might disagree on, on how things are presented uh, to, to the public when trying to schedule uh, somebody into the convention center or whatever it might be. It's intended to cover non-financial disputes between the two of them. It's intended to cover those things which are differences of opinion. And at some point, if you have the two that, that simply can't resolve a, an issue about how to manage a certain part of the, the operation, that then it comes to the city for, for final decision. Okay. And I would and, and, and I would anticipate stuff that we th probably don't need to get involved in. So you're right. I understand. That would be through Mike Cooper and his department. Which is what we do now. Okay. Councillor Aguilar has a question for Jim. While you're yeah, there. I also have a question for Jim. Are the capital infusions included in the event revenue for the incentives? No. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Councillor Entman. Yeah, I have a question for Jay. 
And this has to deal with his capital infusion of the $640,000. I mean, here you've got three phases, Jay. You spell out the convention center upgrades in phase one, which is the initial. The grand opening and marketing, I understand, is $25,000. And then the event center upgrades beginning in 2014. Can you tell us a little bit about what upgrades that you envision with your capital infusion, please? Sure, yeah. The uh, phase one for the convention center um, is going to cover uh, the bar experience. So there's a series of portable carts that come together to, to create one uh, kind of grand circular bar. Uh, so that's, that's one that'll have a, its own uh, special menu and uh, un unique drinks to Sioux Falls. Uh, we'll also have the kitchen experience, which is another uh, portable cart uh, system where that'll allow our chefs to go into the rooms or if we're doing uh, tastings, it'll allow them to be right there with the guests cooking right in front of them. Um, so those are the two major uh, parts for phase one uh, with the convention center. Uh, phase two, the 450000 for the event center. Um, a big part of that would be the Quest point of sale system, the computerized uh, credit card um, system that we use to uh, do transactions with our fans and our guests. Uh, also, a big part of that would be the um, concession carts. So we'll have uh, everything from draft beer, portable carts, um, to uh, carts with uh, cooking capabilities on there. Uh, again, extra point of sales, all revenue generating uh, items on there. Great. Thank you. One more. Um, and thanks, Jay. That, that answers my questions. You know, I, I'd really like to make a little bit of a statement here, too. Like, like Councillor Jamis and I agree, the negotiating team, I think, needs to be commended for the work they did. I know it was long and tedious. I know we were all hoping, I think, that it was going to be done a little bit sooner than what we expected. But again, I'd like to thank all of those that were involved. Uh, you know, it, it just seems to me um, that I'm excited by this agreement and by the teams that were selected because these folks are people that are known to Sioux Falls already. They're folks that we've done business with in the past that we have existing relationships with. And to me, that really, really makes sense. And I'm excited about what the future holds for us. The marketing dollars and the extra dollars that they're infusing into this, I think it shows a little bit of their commitment to this community. And I believe that both of these gentlemen, knowing them personally, are going to stick their hearts and souls into this, and that's what really makes this exciting. And I know you've got big brother standing over your shoulders uh, with that big hammer to ensure that you're going to be profitable. And I think that that's one of the things that we need to keep in mind, too, that this process was a competitive bid process. And a lot of, there were, was a number of citizens in the advisory groups that were in this that had no skin in this, but they were looking out for the benefit of the city and the good of the city as we could look forward to this great facility that we're going to open up. And most exciting of all to me is the free enterprise system that we're addressing here. I mean, the bottom line is, guys, um, the more you sell, the more we're all going to make. Uh, and that's got to be exciting from a city standpoint. I know Tracy just sits here with smiles on his face because that also means we're generating more sales tax dollars. And we know how important the sales tax dollars and those revenues are for the city of Sioux Falls. And, uh, you know, as far as pricing is concerned and, and uh, ticket pricing, I'm not really too concerned about that because, again, the free market price sits into this. You know, the market is going to determine the pricing on the tickets. And you guys are going to be responsible for that. Your, your, uh, your entertainers want so much money. Uh, they need so much money to make a success. Your promoters are handling the risk. And I think that we all know that. And just like in my business, the key to all of this, and to the city as well, is that we are going to be customer focused and you are going to be customer focused. Yes, you've got clients coming in, but we are also your customer, the city of Sioux Falls, and I know you want to make us all happy. So, you know, from a standpoint of looking at this process, it's been a long process for 10 to 15 years we've been looking at all this. We're getting really close to the end, and I'm excited about this, and I think that the contract is, uh, has been very well written, and I'm, I'm, I'm excited to move forward with this, and I'd like to thank all of those involved. Thank you. Any other questions, comments from council? I do. Just one final uh, question for tonight. Um, the intent was not to go through this detail of presentation, but what is your council wishes as far as tonight? for the two resolutions. If I might speak for council, just that we keep it somewhat brief, that it be a review, that folks be reminded that it is available on SiouxFalls.org and it will replay on CityLink. 
but that um, I don't believe council is, just based on my gut, I don't believe council is interested in hearing the entire thing. Okay. I'm seeing heads shaking. I'm seeing Councilor Jamison comment. If I could, I think uh, Councilor Rolfing's comment about the operating expense and just how SMG is paid, for instance, if you could just elaborate a little bit on that because I think some of us are still confused potentially about that, but I, I probably understand the public quite doesn't get it either. <laughs> and I think if you just expand upon that a little bit, I think that'd be helpful. If, yes, if I might comment on that, uh, yes. I would think both of them would be good, both SMG and Ovation saying, you know, here's the income coming out, here's what they keep or send back or we send back, et cetera, et cetera, and how, uh, how that works. For clarification, do you want it for the current system or do you no, want the them new. to project? The new okay. system. Is that a possible? That we're, dealing, we're dealing with the contracts now, okay. the one that we're going to vote on. All right. Thank you. We'll look forward to tonight's vote. We're going to talk about that. You want those questions answered tonight is what you're saying. Is that right? Okay. Then if I might just add to the conversation just very briefly, Jay, I want to talk menu for a minute. <laughs> uh-huh. No the dogs. Everything's Fresh campaign sounds really exciting. The thing that I want to remind council is that through a federal grant, the city health department has um, done a study in Sioux Falls called Live Well Sioux Falls. And community-wide, the number one issue that we have regarding our health is our nutrition. And so Live Well Sioux Falls would like to challenge Ovations and the event center to be that sort of flagship menu for you know, fun food that is also healthy and some options. The students in Sioux Falls are learning through something called the Munch Code, which is green, yellow, and red stickers that, that uh, vending machines and concession stands can be healthy as well. I'm not saying take away beer and peanuts and nachos, but we are challenging you from Live Well Sioux Falls to Ovations and the, and the new event center that that be one of those things that we look at as a shining example of how Sioux Falls can be healthier as well as providing first class entertainment. So that's my challenge to you, Jay. All right, perfect, we'll take it. Thank you. <laughs> Any other comments or questions? Jim, are is, we gonna, um, re is there a rebuttal time? <laughs> there's not. As a chair, I say no, there is not. <laughs> I would think that we'll be inviting ovations to be part of Live Well Sioux Falls as well. So, other comments or questions? We do have a public service committee after this. We will say 10 minutes according to the Carnegie Town Hall clock. We will come back to public service and this meeting is adjourned.